So we're going to pick it up. I'm going to read Daniel chapter 5, and we're going to read it from the New Living Translation because we haven't read it from this so far. Um, but here we go. Many years later, King Belshazzar gave a great feast for a thousand of his nobles, and he drank wine with them. While Belshazzar was drinking the wine, he gave orders to bring in the gold and the silver cups that his predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar, had taken from the temple in Jerusalem. He wanted a drink from them with his nobles, his wives, and his concubines. So they brought these gold cups taken from the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his nobles, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. While they drank from them, they praised their idols made of gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. Suddenly, they saw the fingers of a human hand writing on the plaster wall of the king's palace near the lampstand. The king himself saw the hand as it wrote, and his face turned pale with fright. His knees knocked together in fear as his legs gave way beneath him. The king shouted for the enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers to be brought before him. He said to these wise men of Babylon, whoever could read this writing and tell me what it means will be dressed in purple robes of royal honor and will have a gold chain placed around his neck. He will become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. But when all the king's wise men had come in, none of them could read the writing or tell him what it meant. So the king grew even more alarmed as his face turned pale. His nobles, too, were shaken. But when the queen mother heard what was happening, she hurried to the banquet hall. She said to Belshazzar, long live the king. Don't be so pale and frightened. There's a man in your kingdom who has within him the spirit of the holy gods. During Nebuchadnezzar's reign, this man was found to have insight, understanding, and wisdom like that of the gods. Your predecessor, the king, your predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief over all the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and fortune tellers of Babylon. This man, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar, has exceptional ability and is filled with divine knowledge and understanding. He can interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve difficult problems. Call for Daniel, and he will tell you what the writing means. So Daniel was brought in before the king. The king asked him, Are you, Daniel, one of the exiles brought from Judah by my predecessor, King Nebuchadnezzar? I have heard that you have the spirit of the gods within you and that you're filled with insight, understanding, and wisdom. My wise men and enchanters have tried to read the words on the wall and tell me their meaning, but they cannot do it. I'm told that you can give interpretations and solve difficult problems. If you can read these words and tell me their meaning, you will be clothed in purple robes of royal honor, and you'll have a gold chain placed around your neck. You'll become the third highest ruler in the kingdom. Daniel answered, answered the king, keep your gifts or give them to someone else, but I will tell you what the writing means. Your majesty, the most high God, gave sovereignty, majesty, glory, and honor to your predecessor, Nebuchadnezzar. He made him so great that people of all races and nations and languages trembled before him in fear. He killed those he wanted to kill and spared those he wanted to spare. He honored those he wanted to honor and disgraced those he wanted to disgrace. But when his heart and mind were puffed up with arrogance, he was brought down from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. He was driven from human society. He was given the mind of a wild animal, and he lived among the wild donkeys. He ate grass like a cow, and he was drenched with the dew of heaven until he learned that the Most High God rules over the kingdoms of the world and appoints anyone he desires to rule over them. You are his successor, 
O Belshazzar. And you knew all this, yet you've not humbled yourself, for you have proudly defied the Lord of heaven and have had these cups from his temple brought before you. You and your nobles and your wives and concubines have been drinking wine from them while praising gods of silver, gold, bronze, iron, wood, and stone, gods that neither see nor hear nor know anything at all. But you have not honored the God who gives you the breath of life and controls your destiny. So God has sent this hand to write this message. This is the message that was written. Mine, mine, take o parson. This is what the words mean. Mine means numbered. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel means weighed. You've been weighed on the balances and have not measured up. Parson means divided. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then, at Belshazzar's command, Daniel was dressed in purple robes. A gold chain was hung around his neck, and he was proclaimed the third highest ruler in the kingdom. That very night... Belshazzar, the Babylonian king, was killed. And Darius the Mede took over the kingdom at the age of 62. Man, he barely had enough time to give the awards to Daniel. <laughs> All right, we're going to go over to the, hand, the normal big handout. We're on page 8. Okay, and... In the middle of the page, two-thirds of the way down, it says Daniel 5, verses 20 to 21. We'll finish Daniel 5 next week. <laughs> That's kind of cool. Okay. It's possible to happen tonight, but I don't think so. What, I just wanted to, and I alluded to this, this thought. We talked about sovereignty last time. The time before that, I alluded to this thought, but I, I, did, but I didn't get to it. I, I really just do want to touch on it. It says in Daniel 5, verse 20, you can see the New King James, it says, But when his heart was lifted up and his spirit was hardened in pride, he was deposed from his kingly throne, and they took glory from him. When his heart was lifted up, well, what's crazy about that is if you go back like a couple verses earlier, he's talking about the fact that those who he wanted to exalt, he exalted. Those he wanted to kill, he killed. Those he wanted to honor, he honored. Those he wanted to debase, he debased. And, you know, but when his heart got lifted up after he killed all those people, You see how odd, doesn't that just kind of rings a little odd to us, doesn't it? But when his heart got lifted up, Daniel 5, 19, he, Nebuchadnezzar's pardoning, he's promoting, he's executing at his own discretion. And that is all before his heart is lifted up in Daniel 5, 20. Art Scroll points out, Daniel now cited proof to his contention that Nebuchadnezzar's actions were, in general, divinely inspired. It was not until his heart grew proud that he was removed from his kingdom and he met his deserved punishment. So what did he do? What was the thing? In other words, if killing people and doing, treating people like that, if that wasn't the issue, what was the issue? Okay, in Daniel 4, verse 30, Nebuchadnezzar said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my power and for the honor of my majesty. That's what Nebuchadnezzar said. He was doing fine, and then he made that statement, and when he finished saying that statement, that's when he was debased like an animal. And in this chapter, God says through Daniel to Bel Belshazzar, you knew what happened to Nebuchadnezzar. 
So the thing that Nebuchadnezzar did was he says, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for a royal dwelling by my power and for the honor of my majesty? That's the issue. I did this. It was for my glory. So I was just earlier today, I was, I was thinking, and I almost wish I had brought a handout from... You could look this up online. If Mel can put, I asked her to put this in the in the uh, stream on Zoom. So if she if she could do that, but I taught here the Book of Numbers in 2018. We did the whole year on on life in the wilderness, and from we taught the Book of Numbers for that year. And on October 13th, you can find us in the Gateway Jewish YouTube page. On October 13th, 2018, I taught on Numbers chapter 20. And in Numbers chapter 20, there is the story of Moses being denied entry into the promised land. The normal teaching on that in evangelical circles is he hit the rock instead of speaking with it. That does not work. It just does not work. Okay, Let me, I, in fact, I'll read you the chapter, okay? We're, we like to learn the Bible, right? Okay, here we go. Numbers chapter 20. It just doesn't work to say that it was because he hit the rock. Then the, this is Numbers 20. Then the children of Israel, the whole congregation, came into the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed in Kadesh, and Miriam died there and was buried there. Now, there was no water for the congregation, so they gathered together against Moses and Aaron. And the people contended with Moses and spoke, saying, If only we had died when our brethren died before the Lord. Why have you brought up the assembly of the Lord into this wilderness, that we and our animals should die here? And why have you made us come out of Egypt to bring us to this evil place? Is it not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates? Or it is not a place of grain or figs or vines or pomegranates, nor is there any water to drink. So Moses and Aaron went from the presence of the assembly to the door of the tabernacle of meeting, and they fell on their faces. So the people are saying, you brought us out here to die. There's no water. What does Moses do? He goes to the presence of God. And the glory of the Lord appeared to them. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod. He tells them, Take the rod. Without exception, every single time God tells Moses to take the rod, and there's many of them, he is trained by God to use the rod. In Exodus 17, he's told to take the rod and strike the rock. The story of him using the rod is throughout all of the plagues. He is told to take the rod and hit something or use the rod. God commands Moses, take the rod. And in fact, the word take is in the command form. Take the rod. I'm commanding you, Moses, take the rod. <laughs> Okay, he says, you and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together. Speak to the rock before their eyes. Okay, take the rod, speak to the rock. He does not tell Moses, do not hit the rock. There is never another time in the scripture where he tells him to take the rod and not to use the rod. We have no reason to believe in this passage that he does not speak to the rock as he takes the rod. See the point? It doesn't work to say that he, because he, in the first time he took the rod, when he's told in Exodus 17, he says, take the rod and strike it. Why would he now be punished for doing exactly what God trained him to do? Take the rod and speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. Thus you shall bring water for them out of the rock and give drink to the congregation and their animals. So Moses took the rod from before the Lord as he commanded him. He did exactly what he was commanded to do. 
<laughs> and Moses and Aaron gathered the assembly together before the rock. He said to them, hear now, you rebels. Must we bring water for you out of this rock? Then Moses lifted his hand and struck the rock twice with the rod. And water came out abundantly. God gave the water. And the congregation and their animals drank. Then Moses spoke to Aaron. Moses, then the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron. Because you did not believe me to hollow me. The word hollow means to sanctify or to make me separate. To treat to something that's hallowed, holy, is separate. Because you did not separate me. You did not treat me as though I was distinct. Because you did not hallow me in the eyes of the children of Israel. Therefore, you shall not bring this assembly into the land which I have given them. Moses' problem is not because he hit the rock. Moses' problem, the scripture directly says, is because he did not hallow God. This is not original to me. I got this from the Jewish Publication Society commentary on the book of Numbers. Moses' problem is that in every other case, for example, when Moses is confronting Pharaoh, and he'll say, when do you want the frogs gone? I will let you decide the time. And Pharaoh tells him the time, and Moses leaves and goes out alone and prays. He doesn't even pray in front of Pharaoh. Or how do you want this done? And Pharaoh makes this statement, and Moses leaves and goes out and does it. But in this case, what Moses does, obviously he does something really bad, and what he does is very out of character for him. He says, must we... Here now, you rebels, must we bring you water out of this rock? Must we? God is my good friend, <laughs> and it's him and me and my sidekick, Aaron, and we're going to bring this water out. And that's his sin. You did not hallow me. See the point there? It's not that he spoke to the rock or hit the rock. He was trained to hit the rock. He was trained to use the rod all these times. And if you want a whole lesson on that, go back to October 13th, 2018. Um, there's a sermon on Numbers chapter teaching in this room on Numbers chapter 20, and it's available on the Gateway Jewish YouTube page. So I just, and that is essentially what Nebuchadnezzar's sin was. When he said, um, hey, I built this great kingdom by my own power and for my own glory. That was Moses' sin. And that's Belshazzar knew that story, and yet he did what he did. I think that's pretty obvious. So, all right, anyway. Let's go over to page nine. Um Okay, so um, we're just going to go down to the, the Daniel five twenty two to twenty three, and I don't have I I realized as I looked at this last week that I did I I managed to skip something I usually put a lot in the you know on everything but there's something of significance that I that I didn't put and that's why I gave you an extra handout for today. You'll see that extra handout. It's called extra material in Daniel five twenty three. Because I missed something here that I, I wish I had done. So Daniel 5, verse 23. And you have praised the gods of silver, gold, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone, which do not see, hear, or know. Okay. Idols do not see or hear or know. They do not have any other living senses. God does. In Deuteronomy chapter 4, we find that this is mentioned for the first time. 
when you beget children and grandchildren and have grown old in the land and act corruptly and make a carved image in the form of anything and do evil in the sight of the Lord your God to provoke him to anger. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you will be soon utterly perished from the land which you cross over to the Jordan to possess, that you will not prolong your day, you will not prolong your days in it, but you'll be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the peoples and you'll be left few in number among the nations where the Lord will drive you. And there you will serve gods, the work of men's hands, wood and stone, which neither see nor hear nor eat nor smell. And from there you will seek the Lord your God and you will find him if you seek him with all your heart and with all your soul. Evidently, these idols do not see, they do not hear, they do not eat, they do not smell. Evidently, God he sees, God hears, God, he, he, his, the offerings are called his food, and he can smell. God is a living being, unlike idols. That's what he's saying. And I like to remind myself often, I've prayed this countless times, God made the seeing eye and the hearing ear. He sees exactly what we're all going through. He knows it, he can hear everything, even the groans of our heart he can hear. Even the groan, there is no language that has no meaning. So literally, even when you groan, he knows what that means in your heart. Psalm 94, verse 9, he who planted the ear, shall he not hear? He who formed the eye, shall he not see? Proverbs 20, the, the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. And as I think of this, I wanted to do this adequately, so I am reminded as well of the calling of Isaiah. And this is going to be a challenge for a lot of people who have modern sensitivity abilities to what the scripture says, which are sometimes not always biblical. Okay. Look at the calling of Isaiah. And he touched my mouth with the, with the coal that he said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away and your sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. And he said, go and tell this people, Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Make the heart of this people dull and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and return and be healed. And then I said, Lord, how long? And he answered, until the cities are laid waste and without inhabitant. The houses are without a man, and the land is utterly desolate. The Lord has moved, removed men far away, and the forsaken places are many in the midst of the land. But yet a tenth will be in it and will return and be for consuming, as a terebinth tree or as an oak whose stump remains when it is cut down, so the holy seed shall be its stump. Now, that is a really intense calling. What God is telling Isaiah to do is, I want you to preach this way, he says, and I want you to do it because it's going to, it's just going to be, he's, I'm calling you to preach judgment. That's what he says to the prophet. But what is so intense is that the, re the reason this is so, like, in our face against our modern sensibilities is, and it is, it really feeds or is used by people who preach replacement theology. That's all Old Testament. It doesn't apply to the New Testament. The problem with that kind of pablum is that that passage is repeated six times in the New Testament, including every gospel. Yeah, that's pretty wild, isn't it? In Matthew chapter 13, I'll just read Matthew, and I'll read Romans. And the disciples came and said to him, why do you speak to them in parables? He just gave the parable of the, the sower. 
Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered and said, Because it has been given to you, know, the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For whoever has, to him will more be given, and he will have abundance. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. Therefore I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand, and in them the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear and shall not understand. He's quoting what we just read now. And seeing you will see and not perceive, for the hearts of this people have grown dull, their ears are hard of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts in turn, so that I should heal them. Now that's New Testament. That is not Old Testament. That is clearly Jesus himself, the person that is mischaracterized by the vast majority of the world as being a mamby-pamby kind of personality. And that is clearly him quoting that. So if reading the Bible does not make you uncomfortable with some of your theology, you're not reading it very deeply. Because he's really, he's doing that there. You'll find the same thing in Mark chapter 4. You'll find the same thing in Luke chapter 8. You'll find the same thing in John chapter 12. You'll find the same thing in the last chapter of Acts as Paul is in Rome preaching and the church in Rome is split. Some of the people, some of the Jews are listening to him and other Jews are not listening to him. And so he will then quote the St. Paul, who many people like to say, well, because now you're, now you're Acts. At last chapter of Acts, you're completely New Testament. That's the last chapter of Acts. You could say the Gospels are Old Testament, if, and there's a way to this legitimate statement there. But you can't do that with the last chapter of Acts. And people who want to say that Paul is, you know, like he's preaching this new gospel and the Pauline gospel is all about grace and all about forgiveness, but this is Paul, right, using that same passage. And then the last place it's mentioned is Romans. Romans 11. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect have obtained it, and the rest were blinded. Just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not hear, and ears that they see, and, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. So Paul quotes it in Romans 11, 7 and 8. If you go down just a little bit farther, in verse 11, it says, I say then, have they, has Israel stumbled that they should fall? Now, he doesn't say, have they just say, have they stumbled? The answer to that would be yes. The question, though, is have they stumbled that they should fall? That's a different question, right? We've all stumbled. You have stumbled in your faith. I have stumbled in my faith. But we trust in the grace of God, right? Okay, so have they stumbled that they should fall? And then meganoite is the Greek. It literally means by no means. In fact, um, Literally, it would be a legitimate translation to say, that's a stupid question. I'm always like, perish the thought. <laughs> <laughs> right? yeah, perish the thought. I think one translation might have that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so um, certainly not. But through their fall, through Israel's fall, for the purpose of provoking Israel to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. Esther used that phrase. That passage in her testimony. So what God did, and then and then you go a little bit farther in verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. The deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. So what we see is that in God, the sovereign God, who wants to save all people, the plan of God includes a stumbling by Israel to open a path for the gospel to also then be made available to the Gentiles as well. Gentiles stumble as well. Then the plan after the gospel is offered to the Gentiles is brought back and offered to Israel through the Gentiles. 
Why did God save Abraham? To be a blessing to all the nations, to all the Gentiles. Genesis chapter 12, but also Genesis chapter 22. So, okay, he says, God, I will make you a blessing to all, uh, all the families of the earth, all the mishpacha, but he changes it in Genesis 22 to all of the nations of the earth, all of the goyim, all of the Gentiles of the earth. So God saved Abraham because he, and he saved the Jew because he loves the Gentiles. Then why did God save the Gentiles? Well, Paul plainly says it in, Gen in Romans chapter 11, verse 11. Salvation is come to the Gentiles for the purpose of provoking Israel to jealousy so that they'll get saved. That's, the, that's God's plan. So in other words, God saved the Jew for the Gentiles. God saved the Gentiles for the Jew. So that we both need each other. So God's plan includes a stumbling of Israel so that he can save the world. But it includes, and why did, if I can say to the Jewish people in the room, why did God save us? Because he loves the Gentiles. I should be able then to say to the Gentiles, why did God save you? And it is to be a witness to Israel. You have no right at all to claim any benefit from Abraham and the Jewish people if you do not also claim the responsibility to bring the gospel to the Jewish people. See the point there? That's really the picture. Okay? God saved the Jew because he loves the Gentiles. God saved the Gentiles because he loves the Jew. And the vast majority of Jewish people who get saved are led by Gentiles. That's just how it works. And 100% of the Gentiles who got saved got saved through the Jews. <laughs> <laughs> Literally 100%. So the picture here is, is 1 Corinthians 11, 11. Neither is the man independent of the woman nor the woman independent of the man and the Lord. Galatians 3, 28. There's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for you're all one in Christ. So we need each other. Um, so the question for us, of course, is do we have idols who neither speak nor hear? Do we stumble over idols of materialism? in the form of cars, houses, bank accounts, boats, jobs, or self-esteem? And do we compromise our integrity to gain these things? And I think the answer to a lot of that is, yeah, we do. And it's not just Israel who stumbles, like Isaiah says, but it's Gentiles too. It's the human condition. And we all need each other. So... Um, Going back to the big handout, I'm on page nine, and we're not going to get to the hand of the Lord. I thought we would. I, I could, but uh, but I want to finish page nine. It won't take very long. Um, so right after Daniel 5, 22 and 23, in the magenta color, Belshazzar had the opportunity to have learned this lesson from his grandfather. He knew that God had done what he did with Nebuchadnezzar. He had the opportunity. But he refused to learn that lesson. And consequently, God held Belshazzar accountable. God holds people accountable for the lessons that they should have learned from their ancestors. I'm responsible for what I should have learned from my parents and grandparents. Our children are responsible for what they should learn from us. And the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 6, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. That's New Testament, clearly New Testament. He's quoting the fifth commandment. And he's saying, you'll live long and prosper, as Spock says, you know. You'll live long and prosper if you do this. So God actually holds Belshazzar accountable for lessons he should have learned 
from his great, actually Nebuchadnezzar's his grandfather. Daniel's admonishment of the king was strikingly bold since he made it before a, a thousand guests at the king's banquet. It is likely that they all silently listened as Daniel derided the king. Essentially, Daniel is saying, Belshazzar, you knew that Nebuchadnezzar's pride was disdained by the God of Israel. You knew that it was because of his pride that the God of Israel humbled Nebuchadnezzar for seven years. Nevertheless, you deliberately challenged the God of Israel by using the goblets for, from his temple for your drunken orgy. And we might also recognize that the queen, of, the queen mother was probably there to hear this. Um, I don't see... I thought we would do the hand of the Lord. You know what? I will. I because we don't have an owning in here. I'll go for. I I can easily get done by five thirty. So let's just let's just go a little bit longer because I really want to do the hand the hand the hand of the Lord. Okay. So, um, in on page ten, then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this writing was written. Okay. So the fingers of the hand clearly this is the hand of the Lord. So it raises the question, what is this hand? And generally speaking, the hand of the Lord is a symbol of protection, power, and provision. But it's a lot more than that. So what I did was I went through all of the places where you'll see the hand of the Lord mentioned in the Scripture. And I just looked to see how they actually, what does it look like? How do they break out? What's the... You know, what does it say? What can I actually get from the Bible? Okay. And I'll just, uh, there are seven ways that I found that the hand of the Lord is really about God's active engagement. In other words, God's doing something. His hand is there. He's doing something. That's the hand of the Lord. So it's actual hand, hands-on, if you will. But under that umbrella, there's, there's seven of them. Okay, first of all, the hand of the Lord in judgment. That's clearly activity. In Exodus 9, Moses is talking to Pharaoh, and he says, Behold, the hand of the Lord will be on your cattle in the field. So the hand of the Lord, there's judgment there. In 1 Samuel 12, Samuel's talking to Israel after um, God gave Israel the king they wanted, who was King Saul. And so Samuel says to Israel, if you do not, do not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then the hand of the Lord will be against you. The active hand, the active involvement of God is judgment. Then Isaiah says to Israel in Isaiah 51, verse 17, Awake, awake, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk at the hand of the Lord, the cup of his fury, you have drunk the dregs, of the cup of trembling and it and drained it out. The dregs are the bottom of the cup, like you know, the, the stuff that collects at the bottom, like your coffee grinds, and you look at the bottom of your coffee, sometimes you have what's in there? That's the dregs. Okay. Um, that's all Old Testament. But this is New Testament now in Acts 13. Then Saul, who's also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit and looked intently at him. That's intently at Elimus, who's also called Bar Jesus. Uh, who's trying to get in the way of Paul preaching the gospel to the pro-council in Acts chapter 13. So Paul looks intently at him, and he says to Elimus, O full of all deceit and fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? And now, indeed, the hand of the Lord is upon you, the act activity of God. And you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time, and immediately a dark mist fell on him. That's New Testament. That's not Old Testament. That's New Testament. And he, a, a dark mist fell on him. He went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. And then the second place we can see this hand of the Lord is seen in salvation. Um, what happens in Acts chapter 11 is there's a persecution that causes the dispersal of all the believers. And in that context, in Acts 11.20, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who went who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, that's Jewish people who are engaged in the culture of the day. It'd be like, that, the Hellenists would be like the Jews who attend Gateway Church, whereas the Hebraic Jews would be more like the Jews who would say go to a Messianic synagogue. So if you are a Jewish person in this room, 
you're, you are like me, a Hellenized Jew. That's Acts chapter 6. These are the first, the first deacons of the church were all Hellenized Jews um, ra rather than Messianic Jews. Okay, so and the hand of the Lord was with them as they went around. So the hand of the Lord w was active in salvation. I did feel, I won't read it just by virtue of time, and that's the only reason, because I would like to read Isaiah 53, but I won't. But it does not mention the hand of the Lord. It does mention the arm of the Lord. Okay? Who has believed our report to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And the picture there is of God rolling up his sleeve and showing his naked arm. The strength of God. Right? But he shows it through weakness. He shows it through a Messiah, Savior, who's going to suffer and die at its strength and weakness, which is actually the definition of the Greek word for meekness is prautes is the Greek word, P-R-A-O-T-E-S. Prautes is the Greek word, and it actually means power under control. So we think of meekness as weakness because they rhyme, but they're not the same. Okay, they're, that's, just, that's just English thinking. Okay. Meekness is power under control. The only two people the Bible calls meek are Moses and Jesus, the two most powerful people of the Bible. They are the meek ones. Learn from me, for I am meek and lowly. Matthew eleven twenty nine, I think, 28, 29. And then uh, in Numbers 12, God says to Miriam and Aram, why were you not afraid to talk like this about Moses? He is the meekest man on the planet. And he, God says that to them because Moses did not defend himself when they were gossiping about him. And that's the context in which God calls Moses the meekest man on the planet. Which is why what he did with the water was so out of character for him. Okay, okay so um, that's Isaiah 53. Then the third thing is the hand of the Lord strengthens. Um, I, First Kings 18:46. The hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins, and he ran ahead of the of Ahab's chariot. So the hand of the Lord strengthens um, Elijah. He can outrun a chariot for like 20 miles. Then in number four, the hand of the Lord is connected to the prophetic voice. Because God's voice is power. God speaks. He says, light be, and there's light. And he just says, light. There's light. Because he said it. His voice has power. So the hand of the Lord is connected to the prophetic voice. But now bring me, Elisha says, a musician. And then it happened when the musician played that the hand of the Lord came upon him. And so he, the prophetic voice comes. Going over to the next page. I am going to get done with this easily. Then on page 12, the hand of the Lord conceals. Okay, so it conceals God's person. So concealing God's person is the concealing is an activity. He uses his hand to conceal, to hide things. So shall it be while my glory passes by that I'll put you in the cleft of the rock and I'll cover you with my hand while I pass by. And then I'll take my hand away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. So his hand conceals. His hand reveals in the prophetic and conceals in these case. And then the hand of the Lord is in blessing. Um, and this is probably my favorite one of all of them. Now Jabez was more honorable than his brother's. And his mother called him Jabez, saying, Because I bore him in pain. And Jabez called on the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Oh, that you would bless me indeed, enlarge my territory, that your hand would be with me, and that you would keep me from evil, that I might not cause pain. So God granted him what he requested. I literally, this is one of my most common daily prayers, is the prayer of Jabez. I encourage you to pray this. The scripture says he prayed it. It says that God answered it. There's four things in this prayer that God that he that he prays for. First of all, he says um, that I would be free from pain. Okay. Well, it is kind of interesting. The New King James Version says that um, says uh, that that I might not cause pain. But I don't know how they do that out of the Hebrew. I really don't know it because. Um, it's really, it's, 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 it's an active verb. 
that I will be free from pain, that I might not suffer pain, that it might not pain me, whereas the New King James puts it in this, that I might not cause, it's a, like a different form. I don't know why they do that. Nevertheless, when I pray this basically every day, uh, this is how I pray it. Lord, would you keep me from evil that I might be free from pain, that I might not cause pain, and that I might be a person who delivers from pain. So that's how I just, I just include the whole thing. But the Hebrew really does seem to say that I might be free from pain. And so um, the four things that he prays for, that you would bless me indeed. And I love, when I see that word indeed, I think of deeds. God, would you do something today? Do something that will bless me. May there be a deed. Would you pay my house off? <laughs> Literally, I pray that often. Do a deed. Would you, would, you, um, would you heal my son? Do a deed. You know, would you, and, I, and I, I will literally say things, and sometimes I will literally open Deuteronomy 28 and pray that chapter. Would you do this for me? Would you make me blessed in the city today? Would you give me favor in the country today? Right? Would you do this? Would you do that? Would you bless me indeed? Would you enlarge my territory? In other words, would you enlarge my influence? And I, and, and I imagine that in my mind as being while I am alive and after I am gone. But would you enlarge my influence, God, in ways that is pleasing to you? That's, and I pray this like this is daily. I'm, I might miss a day or two, but, but it's, it's pretty much daily, every, pretty much every single day. Would you bless me indeed? Would you enlarge my territory? May your hand be with me. Lord, now I just start to, Lord, would you bless me? Would you carry me? Would you cover me? Would you protect me? Would you provide for me? Would you heal me? Would you heal my son? Would your hand of blessing, Lord, touch us? See, I'm asking for his activity. You see what I mean? So would you bless me indeed? Would you enlarge my territory in ways that's pleasing to you? May your hand be with me, and may you keep me from evil, that I might be free from pain, that I might not cause pain, and that I might be a person who delivers from pain. And I, I'm, I think this prayer is really worth making a daily part of your life. Um, the Scripture says, You have not because you ask not. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Is it possible if I actually prayed that, that God would actually give me the better food to eat? Give us this day our daily bread. Um, and um, Forgive us, our forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass. Lord, would you forgive me? Would you keep me? And Lord, would you keep me from evil that I might be free from pain? If the Lord said to pray, keep me from evil, is it possible that I am facing evil situations because I didn't actually just ask him? to keep me from evil. It's worth actually asking him. He said to ask. So it's worth asking. Okay? So I, I'm using that as an example to, to build the idea of praying the prayer of Jabez. Those things are worth praying. They have value. They, they'll change your life. So, all right, so that's where we're going to leave. Now, here's what we're going to do next time. Next time, we are going to, we're going to present, analyze, understand what this weird statement is that God wrote on the wall. That's what we're doing. Lucy. Lord, that you would keep me from evil, that I might be free from pain. Would you keep me from evil, that I might not cause pain.
And the reason I'm doing that, that, that I might is because that's how all the translations, except for the King, King Jimmy, and they make it this, this hiffle, this causative, okay? And I don't know why they do that, but they, they do. So I, but I'm, I, I don't want to leave it off because it's got value, okay? And then the third one is that I might be a person who delivers from pain. Because God does not say, blessed are the peacekeepers, but rather, blessed are the peacemakers. So I don't want to be a person who just, just keeps the peace or just doesn't cause pain, but I want to be a person who actually can maybe deliver people from pain. Thanks for the question. question was there a question somewhere? Oh. The, it's um, it's Aramaic, okay. Um, but there is a there is a Persian word in it, and we'll look at that. What language is the is that weird phrase in? It'll be an itch, it's going to be a, it's it's interesting. It's an interesting thing. And it was Dustin. Did you have a question? Did some? He's coming up. You the Are you doing the blessing? Oh, come on up, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. We'll see you next week.